Thank you for tuning in for another expert interview. I'm Bill Powers with MiningStockEducation.com. The topic of today's discussion centers around profiting from arbitrage opportunities in the junior resource sector. In economics theory, the efficient market hypothesis suggests that at any given time, prices fully reflect all available information on a particular stock and or market. According to this hypothesis, no investor has an advantage in predicting a return on a stock price because no one has access to information not already available to everyone else. My guest today will specifically demonstrate that this theory is not correct in the junior resource sector. Arbitrage exists as a result of market inefficiencies. It's a trade that profits by exploiting price differences of identical or similar financial instruments on different markets or in different forms. The trader or investor capitalizing on arbitrage opportunities buys an asset in one location where it's cheap, then immediately turns around and sells it in a place where it commands a higher price. In its purest definition, arbitrage is a risk-free profit opportunity. Joining me today is Giant Bandari of Anarcho Capital. Giant holds an MBA from Ma Manchester Business School in the United Kingdom. Throughout his career, he has worked for well-known natural resource investors Doug Casey and Frank Holmes. Currently, he advises institutional investors regarding investing in the natural resource sector. Giant's focus is on junior mining companies, and within that focus, he's one of the unique voices educating regarding and lifting up arbitrage opportunities in junior resources from which the average retail investor can profit. Giant, thank you for coming on the program to share your insights. Thank you very much for having me, Ben. Could you begin by sharing your journey of how and why you came to focus on investing in junior mining stocks? In 2013, well, I immigrated to Canada and I came across Doug Casey, who offered me a job to work for him. Those days, I did not have a job. I was close to being broke. Uh, and he was kind enough to give me a job. He put me in touch with relevant people in the industry. And because of him, I got trained in analyzing junior mining companies. Thereafter, I came across Frank Holmes, who was an amazing person and an amazing company to work for. He trained me. He spent a fortune sending me around the world look, to look at mine sites and projects to understand the junior mining industry. And that is how I came into the industry and I stayed on in this industry. And how did you come to focus on uh, looking for arbitrage opportunities uh, within the junior mining sector? I'm an investor and a speculator in the junior mining industry. Now, if I can get something cheaper by 20 or 30 percent, why should I not do that? And that automatically takes me to arbitrage opportunities. Now, arbitrage opportunities offer you a huge upside sometimes, exactly in companies that I might want to invest in anyway. And uh, an extra 30 or 40 percent is a very exciting upside that uh, that helped me uh, make extra money. Why does arbitrage occur specifically in junior mining stocks? Uh, Bill, arbitrage occurs everywhere in life. You want to buy the same can of milk and if you go to two different stores, you will get very different prices. In fact, if you want to get diesel for your car or gasoline for your car, and if you go and visit two gas stations on two sides of the same street, they have very different prices, sometimes as much as 5 to 10% different from each other. Arbitrage exists in these extremely liquid commodities, and junior mining industry is an extremely illiquid industry, which means that arbitrage opportunities are even better and more and offer you even more upside in this industry. Where do you find arbitrage? Uh, where does it occur most frequently within the junior resource sector? Mostly when a liquid company tries to acquire an illiquid company, I see a very nice arbitrage opportunity. And the reason is that when you try to acquire an illiquid company, big investors do not pay much attention to the illiquid companies. 
retail investors, people who can bid for a smaller amount of shares have an opportunity in such situations. Also, when you have an acquiry company that has very tired shareholders who have stuck with that company for a very long time, who want to get out of that company as soon as possible, when a merger is announced, they get a liquidity event which they exploit without actually sometimes doing simple math on what the equation of merger is, and they sell in this liquid event, leaving a lot of money on the table for people who might want to exploit this arbitrage opportunities. But also, Bill, one of the best and most exciting arbitrages I have seen are when the two companies are in completely different jurisdictions. So when a Canadian company wants to acquire an Australian company or when an Australian company wants to acquire a company listed in London, that creates a very exciting arbitrage opportunity. And the reason, Bill, is that a lot of people who invest in Canada do not want to own shares in Australia or cannot trade in Australia because of the brokerage they use. And a lot of people are uh, in these kind of situations. As a result, those when a merger of this kind happens, people in one of the two markets tend to sell their stock as soon as possible. They dump their stock, and that creates sometimes extraordinary arbitrage opportunities for an astute investor. So if I could summarize, the, the best arbitrage opportunities are found in mergers and acquisitions. And some of the underlying reasons are that the smart money or the institutional investors are not interested in these small illiquid companies. And then the dumb money, so to speak, the retail investors are frankly too lazy and too ignorant to see the opportunity. Would that be correct? That is absolutely correct, except that I won't necessarily call retail money dumb money. Uh, institutional money can be very dumb as well. Uh, and I have consistently seen traveling with institutional investors that they are more interested in drinking and women, womenizing when they go on site visits. So I don't necessarily call retail money dumb money, but it's something that they should pay attention to. I stand corrected on that. Regarding arbitrage opportunities, uh, how many significant opportunities in the junior sector do you see on average per year? Bill, very easily, I have about four or five opportunities I'm looking at at any point of time. Uh, I would say minimum of 20 to 30 arbitrage opportunities pass my desk every year. Recently in Vancouver, you gave a lecture, an excellent lecture uh, regarding arbitrage opportunities in the junior sector. And in that lecture, you lifted up Sunridge Gold and the ar arbitrage opportunity that occurred in late 2015 and early 2016. Could you please share with listeners what occurred uh, there? Yeah, this was one of the stories I shared. And Bill, I expanded on this story to convey to people the kind of opportunities that can come to exist and stay in this industry for a very long time and how you can benefit from it by being patient. And if you, if you agree to do some simple math on these mergers and acquisitions. Now, on the, in November 2015, uh, Sundridge news released that they were going to get acquired by a Chinese entity and they were going to get paid a certain amount of money, which Sundridge said in the news release would be transferred immediately to the shareholders of the company and that the company would be closed. Now, this money was going to be anything between, depending on how you calculated the numbers, anything between 37 to 42 cent per share of Sunridge. Now, Sunridge traded for between 24 to 27 cents for the next six months, which meant that if you accumulated Sunridge over those six months, 
you would have positioned yourself for anything between 40 to 60 percent arbitrage upside. Now, that's an amazing arbitrage upside bill, particularly when you're getting cash for what you are buying. 40 to 60 percent arbitrage up, upside existed over six months. And this continued. Uh, most people might think that such opportunities would exist only for a few days or a few hours. But this can exist for months. And that's why one should be very patient and try to get accumulate and try to get these shares for as cheap a price as they can. One of the, one of the fascinating things that you said in your recent lecture uh, was that these arbitra arbitrage opportunities, um, they tend to grow or they can grow over as the months and the weeks pass. And I just find that fascinating. You know, the efficient market theory says they should lessen. But in your experience, you've observed that the arbitrage can grow. Absolutely, Bill. And this what happens is that sometimes in the initial days when liquidity of the two companies is very high, arbitrage can be very small. But as liquidity of one of the companies dries up, arbitrage tends to increase. And for a retail investor, this actually creates a fabulous opportunity to slowly acquire such companies. When you're looking to invest in, and take advantage of an arbitrage opportunity, what uh, percentage uh, profit upside do you look for before you will invest? As much as possible, but uh, I tend to look for anything between 20 to 50% arbitrage upside. Uh, I am very patient, so I will always bid for something that offers me at least 20% upside. But if the deal gets closer to the finalization date, then I might even buy something for 5 or 10% arbitrage upside because if I can make 5 or 10% in a week's time, I don't really worry so much about it. Yeah, that makes sense. What are some key factors, uh, Giant, that either increase or decrease the arbitrage potential in the junior resource stocks? Well, again, uh, as I said, uh, what increases this arbitrage is the lack of liquidity in these companies. The fact that some of the shareholders in these companies might be very tired who want to dump the shares as soon as they can. Um, and these creates this very exciting arbitrage opportunities for people who, who have done some simple math. Now, Bill, it's very important to understand that when, an, when a merger is announced, all you have to do is to do a very, very simple one or two line math to figure out what kind of arbitrage exists in that merger or acquisition. Uh, and you position yourself to make that money then. After you uh, find the merger and acquisition to analyze, you do the math. The math makes sense. What other factors do you look at and what risks are still there uh, for the investor? Well, the biggest risk, of course, is that uh, two risks, let's say. One is that while the merger is happening, even if there's an arbitrage opportunity, the company that is acquiring the smaller company might actually suffer a share price loss. The second problem could be that the deal might not go through. In both cases, in either of the cases, you can you stand to lose money if the merger does not happen or if the buyer, the share price of the buying company falls. What you can do in these two cases is that you firstly have to be sh reasonably sure that the underlying value of the company that you are buying and the value of the merged entity actually makes sense. So that's very important for you to do, to work on, to make sure that you're reasonably confident about the assets and the managements of the two companies. And the second thing you can do is that if you think that the bigger entity that is acquiring this smaller entity, share price of that bigger entity might fall 
you might even want to short sell a stock of that bigger entity to cover yourself from the possibility of drop in share price of the bigger entity uh, yes so you should do some kind of work on the valuation on the underlying assets and do you analyze uh, the underlying assets differently when you're looking to invest for arbitrage purpose rather than, let's say, long-term purposes? I should actually ideally do a full analysis on this comp- these companies as well. However, when the upside is so nice and when there might be an opportunity to short sell the bigger entity, I might refrain from doing a full analysis, but the underlying message stays the same you should feel reasonably confident about the underlying assets and about the managements that run these two companies. Now, Bill, what I have seen on a couple of occasions is that some of the announced mergers were actually fraudulent. And you can't really do anything about these managements because if two friends in two different companies decide to merge their companies and announce it, when they actually never intended to do the merger, they they might have news released that just to get excitement in the market for the two companies. And then they might later decide not to do the merger. You can't really take such managements to courts. And it is therefore very important that you understand the motivations of these managements and you do some kind of valuation of the underlying assets. So do you normally speak to the CEOs or at least the investor relation person when you are researching these mergers and acquisitions? Absolutely. Uh, These junior mining company CEOs are happy to talk with just about anyone who gives them a call. These are so illiquid companies that whosoever calls gets to talk with the CEOs. And you should try to talk with the CEOs because the tone of their voice, how they talk, what kind of information they give you tells you so much about their character and personalities. Giant, other than uh, Sunridge Gold, the example that you just shared, what were some of your most profitable arbitrage trades uh, that you've experienced in junior resources? There were uh, many, uh, uh, as I said, about 20 to, f- 50, 20 to 40 arbitrage opportunities that I see on a yearly basis. Now, I can give you some of the names in which I benefited from investing in these companies. Let's look at Sunridge actually offered me three different arbitrage opportunities. I could invest in the shares. I could invest in the warrants. The warrants were going to be acquired by the company for two cents a share, and the warrants were trading for one and a half cents. They offered me a 33% upside. I could actually buy Sunridge Gold in the U.S. once they had paid off most of the money. And this Sunridge that was still trading in the U.S. offered me between 50 to 100 percent arbitrage upside. There was a company, Kiska Metals, that was going to get acquired by Orico Metals that offered me about 10 to 15 percent arbitrage upside Another company, Treasury Metals, which was acquiring Gold Eye, made me about 20% of my investment. And Bill, this happened over a duration of a few weeks to a couple of months. Uh, Paramount Gold Nevada was a, a very exciting opportunity for me. Um, I bought a lot of underlying uh, of Calico Resources, which was going to be acquired by Paramount. And again, these were in two different jurisdictions. Calico Resources was in Canada and Paramount Gold Nevada was in the U.S. Uh, You could even short sell Paramount Gold Nevada if you wanted to cover yourself. Uh, The arbitrage opportunity was a very exciting 30 to 50 percent over those two or three months that the process was going on. Uh, There was... uh, a very exciting arbitrage when two Australian listed companies were merging, uh, Gryphon Minerals merging with Teranga Gold. 
Similarly, when True Gold was being acquired by Endeavor Mining, uh, the arbitrage was about 30%. So you can have very exciting arbitrage opportunities if you decide to do some simple math on these companies. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And when I think about um, the commodities in the mining sector, it's so volatile. The cycles, you know, is so extreme that it's hard to profit in a commodity down cycle with mining companies. You could short stocks. Uh, you could invest in an explorer that makes a discovery or uh, the new way that you're sharing with listeners today, if they are not aware of it already, is that you could uh, take advantage of these arbitrage opportunities. And um, in your investing career, is this the primary way that you have profited through commodity down cycles? I mostly invest in the junior mining industry as an investor and an, as an, a speculator. However, arbitrage does make a lot of money if you pay attention to it. And over the last several years, increasingly, my focus has shifted towards uh, arbitrage opportunities. I would say about 20 to 40 percent of my money gets invested in arbitrage opportunities. Thank you for being so generous to share this this knowledge and even specific opportunities that you're looking at. I, I've listened and read some of the transcripts over the years when you've been interviewed regarding this subject. And and I have to say, you are very generous with sharing with, with the common man your knowledge. So thank you for that. Thank you. Are there any other ideas or tips regarding profiting from arbitrage um, that you would like to share with the listener before we conclude? I think we have talked enough about it um, uh, there is I, we we have talked about all the issues that one must look at when doing these arbitrage opportunities. Um, again, it's the have a brokerage account where you can have London listed stocks, Canadian listed stocks, and Australian listed stocks. Which means that. When you want, when there is an a merger happening between a Canadian company and an Australian company, and if you buy a Canadian company, and if after the merger it becomes an Australian listed stock, you don't really f won't face any problems if you have a brokerage that trades on all the three exchanges. So have a brokerage account for these arbitrage opportunities. You might pay some extra commissions to to have such a brokerage account uh, but that was that would position you to benefit from arbitrage opportunities when the merger is between companies trading in different jurisdictions excellent advice uh, before you go giant could you please share with listeners regarding the work that you do any upcoming events and how listeners can follow it follow you i advise institutional investors on investing in junior mining industry this is exactly what i do with my own money um, i uh, well i run a philosophy seminar in vancouver every year and the next one is on the 29th of july 2017 and this is vancouver in canada I look forward to this day. We have a full day of philosophical discussion on free market morality, all the things that the world must discuss but somehow refuses to discuss. Um, so that's a great event. Please come for it if you can. And what is the website? Do you have a website for that event? My personal website is jayantbhandari.com, and within that website is a tab called Capitalism and Morality. That is the name of my seminar. And you can get all the details on, on that page. Giant, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Bill. Thank you for watching this MiningStockEducation.com video. Please like and subscribe on YouTube. You can also follow us on Twitter at MiningStockEDU and on the web at MiningStockEducation.com. Learn, invest, profit.